Good afternoon, everyone. I believe that you have been so enriched so far, right? At this very point, the next presenter is coming from the Asian perspective. She comes from India, and she's taking up her Master's, in Master's of Arts in Religion here at IAS. She will be presenting about the topic, The Use of the New Testament, Approaches to Bridge the Gap Between the Concept of Salvation in Hinduism and Christianity. I hope we'll give our attention to Beersheba Maywal. Good afternoon to all. I think uh, we're having a little debate whether we skipped a break or not. Are we okay to move on? Okay, I, I need someone to get into my presentation, please, faster. It's okay. <laughs> Please give us a moment to go into the presentation. I know we've had a long, long morning, and uh, I hope you can sit with me through this. It is indeed a pleasure to be presenting at AATS, and I would like to thank the AATS officers and the team for selecting such a relevant subject that brings home the point, especially for me, and for giving us the opportunity to research and present our findings. OK, thank you so much. I find my roots in Hinduism, and therefore this research was tremendously helpful. It helped me grow in my search, too. God has made me aware of the immense need of my country and my people. I was greatly blessed while doing this research, and I hope you are also as you listen to it. The topic of my paper is the use of New Testament approaches to bridge the gap between the concept of salvation in Hinduism and Christianity. The 21st century world showcases individuals from various cultural, religious, and social backgrounds living together, crossing over traditional boundaries. The emphasis today is uh, more on the faith of individuals, men and women, rather than on religious communities or groups. And this has caused individuals to deepen their own faith in order that they might dialogue with the diversity before them. So interfaith dialogue has become more and more crucial, not only for all mankind, but specifically for theologians. As Barua Ankur says that interreligious dialogue today is unavoidable. It is a religious imperative and a historical duty for which we must suitably prepare. So my paper is on these lines. As we can see, the challenge of understanding the Christian soteriology from the Hindu perspective is evident because the path of salvation greatly differs between the two. In Hinduism, liberation or salvation, also called as moksha, is earned through a life of devotion, meditation, and good deeds. Whereas in Christianity, salvation is a gift of God through Jesus Christ. Salvation is defined as the act or state of being safe in ultimate terms, according to the Oxford Dictionary of World Religions. Typically, uh, the terms salvation and soteriology is used in the Christian context, but it is not unknown in other religions. Salvation, moksha, nirvana, redemption are the other terms that are also used to express this, the concept of salvation. The challenge faced by theologians in the field of soteriology is that Christ died for the salvation of all the world, John 3.17, and yet salvation is found in no other name than that of Jesus Christ, Acts 4.12. The relationship of the universal to the particular in the Christian faith needs to be re-examined in an age where religious pluralism thrives. So this paper basically applies the two main New Testament approaches, which, is, which are fidelity to the scriptures and relevance to the contemporary setting. I'm thankful that uh, Pastor 
Odiombo already ex ex explained about Paul's approach, and I would just be applying some of these approaches. Sorry, let me go ahead. Yes. This paper aims to reflect on the point of similarity between the concept of salvation in Hinduism and Christianity rather than the differences. And finally, it tries to evoke Christian theologians to meet the challenge of Hinduism in a manner open to dialogue and to take practical measures to reach out to the Hindus. So a large section of my paper is actually expounding on the Hindu soteriology and, and basically ap applying the New Testament approaches in order to, to come up with a point of contact between the Hindus and Christians. Hinduism is a religion without a founder, without a central authority and a fixed creed. It is indeed the largest religion, a pluralistic religion in the world. This has caused some of the scholars to look at Hinduism as a collection of cults or sects rather than a consistent religious heritage. It is built on a diversity and opposed a variety of teachings and teachers. Thus, each of these Hindu groups deserve a thorough study on its own, but this lies beyond the scope of this paper. The paper deals with a general view of salvation or liberation that can relate to most Hindus. And on the other hand, an in-depth study of each of these groups will help provide specialized measures to reach out to certain groups. So before we dive into the main section of this paper, we first need to have a good understanding of what salvation is in a pluralistic world. Some of us have already presented on this, so I will quickly brush, brush through it. There are four basic views of salvation in a pluralistic view. They are the unitive, pluralistic view, inclusivistic view, particularistic view, and exclusive particularistic view. John Hick is a supporter of the unitive, pluralistic view. He says that all religions are on an equal footing before God and provide salvation in their own right. He points out that all world religions produce morally righteous people. He defines salvation or liberation as a transformation that leads one away from self-centeredness towards a reality-centeredness. According to him, it is applicable, applicable across religions. So he, uh, he professes that, um, according to him, open understanding and dialogue among all world religions is OK, since salvation is universally offered by the grace of God through many belief systems. So that is John Hick. On the other hand, Clark Pinnock ad advocates for the inclusivist inclusivistic view. He says that Christ is the ground of all salvation. God's grace can be experienced in other religions, but they themselves do not offer salvation on its own. According to him, this concept helps foster a relationship between Christians and people from other religions. So he basically is open to dialogue with other religions. He includes that God's work of salvation is not restricted to a religious framework. Alistair McGrath uh, supports the particularistic view. He advocates that salvation is found only by knowing and trusting in Christ as Savior. He believes that the knowledge of God as Creator is available to all people, but the knowledge of God as Redeemer is only available in and through Christ. Thus, he encourages us as Christians to share the particular understanding of salvation offered through Jesus Christ with members of other religion. In this way, offering a way of inclu including them into Christianity, therefore this view advocates the salvation is universally offered, but not universally shared. The last and the fourth view is that of uh, Douglas and Gary Phillips. It is an inclu inclusive particularistic view. 
They believe that salvation is available only through the explicit response to the gospel and personal belief in Jesus Christ. They exclude the unevangelized from salvation. And they also reject the idea of interreligious dialogue for the purpose of mutual understanding. They support if Christians were to be involved in such a dialogue, it must be done only with the purpose of convincing the practitioners of other religions of the particular truths of Christianity. So only if you want to convert a person, then only get into such a dialogue is their view. But I like what John Moffat says. He says that Christ has been revealing himself in non-Christian faiths throughout history, but also that to those non-Christians temperamentally unfitted to become professing Christians, he has been revealing himself in ways fully sufficient to their ne deepest needs. So we have a personal God who speaks to us. That's what jo John Moffat says. Ellen White, according to Dr. Gerhard Fandel's research, he says that there are three categories regarding the salvation of the heathen. First, oh yes, First, God's general way of saving the heathens is through the church. Second, God brings honest people among the heathen in contact with the gospel. And third, the Holy Spirit speaks to individuals in heathen lands and bring them, brings them the gospel without any human resources. So God is willing to use you, but even if not, the Holy Spirit is at work. And that's what Ellen White says in her, in her writings. 1 Timothy 2, 4 says that God wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It is evident in Cornelius' story. He is a Roman centurion, a good example of how the Holy Spirit works in the lives of those who seek and fear, the, fear God. In Acts 10, 1 to 10, this, this account suggests that those who live out of the reach of Christians when touched by the Spirit sincerely yearn for something better, and the path is paved for us to minister the gospel to them. So the Holy Spirit is paving a path for us to reach out to people. In conclusion, this is the idea that we're building in before we reach, before we get into the concept of Hindu soteriology. So scriptures reveal that salvation and eternal life requires, can only be experienced through Jesus Christ. But Jesus came as a light to the Gentiles and as their salvation, Isaiah 49, 6. Moreover, the Gospel Commission requires that the knowledge of salvation through Jesus Christ be proclaimed to the world, Matthew 28, Revelation 14. Hence, salvation requires faith in Jesus Christ, Acts 16 and Romans 1. So uh, the basic New Testament approaches that we'd be applying is, is that of fidelity to scripture and tradition and relevance to the contemporary setting. It is assumed that the modern situation of religious pluralism is unique to our generation and therefore cannot relate to the New Testament period. In fact, however, the Hellenistic worldview was one of religious pluralism. So we can take home lessons for us today. The evangelist John had developed the tradition which he inherited in a number of striking ways and applied it. But this was done as a response to Jewish objection to Christian beliefs, an attempt to legitimate those beliefs and defend them as faithful to Judaism, uh, Judaism's traditions and heritage. So John had a different appro approach on the other hand, the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, was willing to interact with the content of context of pluralism he lived and worked. He did not simply abandon his Jewish Christian heritage, but used it as a starting point of conversation. I, I like what Paul does. He, he creatively brings home the understanding of Christ and salvation to his audiences and to those who ministered. And therefore, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, worshiped together in the churches he 
he planted and ministered. We can see that in Galatians 3.28, Colossians 1.15 to 20, Acts 17. Paul contextualized the message that he received. He sought to find new ways of expressing that message. Thus, Paul creatively offers Christ as the ground of unity within a world of plurality. This Paul grasps both poles, faithfulness and relevance, and refuses to let go of either. In conclusion, we can say that biblical and contemporary theologians is to hold both of these poles, faithfulness to scriptures and relevance to our context in mind when we approach the pluralistic context. Let's move to our understanding of Hinduism, soteriology in Hinduism. As you see, uh, these are the countries where Hindus are mostly concentrated. You can see uh, India in bright orange. That's where it's highly concentrated in parts of Australia, North America, parts of Europe, Middle East, and, and the southern part of Africa. So Hinduism is not just uh, retained in India or Asia. It has its bearings across the world. This is statistics from 2012. I, I'm sure it's pretty much increased or changed by now. But this is, just gives us a general view of what we're looking at. Excuse me. Salvation in Hinduism. Hinduism is uh, one of the living religions that originated in Southern Asia. Salvation or moksha, according to Hindu theists, is a liberation from pain, suffering, loss, and estrangement of every kind. Thank you. It is the freedom of enjoying union with God. Moksha, the term for salvation in Hinduism, is genuine self-affirmation than self-negation. In order to uh, understand the concept of salvation in Hinduism, we have to understand, we have to have a good understanding of the nature of man, karma, reincarnation, and sin. So I will briefly uh, go through with you through these uh, four main concepts which contribute to Hindu soteriology. The nature of man. Hindus believe that all, all creatures, including humans, animals, and plants, have the same absolute conscience, which is called Atman. This principle describes the concept of the one in many. It states that the one universal Brahman, the absolute one, is present in all beings as Atman. The inequality of human beings needed to be explained since all creatures are created perfect and Atman, which is a part of Brahman, the ultimate reality for them, resides in all. According to their belief, this deity is conceived as a pure being. Hence the fate of individuals, pain, suffering, injustice, social inequality cannot be blamed on the deity. Therefore, due to these qualitative differences, we ne they needed to explain such qualitative differences and came up with the concepts of karma and reincarnation. In Hinduism, the divine in man is significant, and salvation is a process by which the potentially divine in man becomes actual and thus enables him to realize his true nature. So... The salvation, the concept of salvation in man in Hinduism is totally different from that of Christianity. It is because when a man realizes the absolute, the divine in him, that's when he receives moksha. And that is contrary to our concept of salvation. Karma and re reincarnation. Karma is a Sanskrit verb which means to do or act. The law of karma states that Every act and every omission, insofar as it is due to ignorance, self-centeredness, sensual appetite, or laziness, 
has an internal as well as external effect. So karma is basically your actions. It is an immutable law which holds a person accountable for his actions in the next life. Karma is operational until the individual soul merges with the et eternal soul, the Brahman. Hindu be Hindus believe in the existence of a subtle substance called jiva or jivatman that migrates from life to life. According to Sh Shivite conception, the jiva contains a subtle aggregate of conditions and perceptions called the inter inner instrument. Now, this inner instrument records an individual's perce perceptions, sensations, thoughts, and also imprints left by one's own actions called karma. So you carry on your actions in this inner instrument. And uh, the Samakya teachings also reflect the idea that karma can impact an individual's disposition. So uh, an individual can either enjoy the fruit of his actions or reap the reap his, the the co consequences of his actions depending on his or her life you can reap the these consequences it, if not in this life then in the future life in this way all individual and social differences are self acquired thus there is a possibility of an individual's development in a number of lives in the time being, the soul remains temporarily caught up in the cycle of births, whether subjected to good or bad karma. Hence, creatures with bad karma will be freed from rebirth at the latest of these births, when the highest deity, which is Brahman, mercifully grants them moksha. While in contrast with those who acquire good karma, they have an opportunity to leave this cycle of births and ascend to a higher region that is no longer submitted to the cycle of rebirth. The doctrine of reincarnation was formulated to explain human in inequality and differences. According to Hindus, reincarnation makes moral sense, confirms divine norms, and enables divine justice. Reincarnation frees the deity from immediate responsibility from all misery in the world without the role of a devil. So there is no concept of a devil in the Hindu, uh, Hindu belief. It also gives hope for a better future in another life if one works on himself to make such improvement possible. So this is the concept of karma and reincarnation in the Hindu philosophy. The concept of sin. Hindus believe that there is no sin. Rather, every act is considered in terms of good and bad karmas. Sin is described as ignorance concerning reality. It is also explained as something that is done against the will of gods, with which causes disease and misfortune. The person whose actions are evil accumulate bad karma, which results in the inhibition of the person's ability to break free from ignorance and illusion. So I, I hope we have a general understanding of these four elements which contribute to uh, our, our understanding of salvation in Hinduism. Now these are the terms of salvation in Hindu literature. There are, there are six words which we'll be looking at. Tarana is the first word. It means causing or enabling to cross, liberating, saving. Udhara, the act of raising, elevating, lifting up, or drawing out. Trana and Raksha have the, the same meaning. Protection, preservation, the act of protecting, guarding, preserving, so, and so on. There are two words which are constantly used, which is mukti and moksha. They are used to uh, denote final liberation, usually the final liberation. Yes, okay, in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. Shreyas is used to describe the state of salvation or, or liberation. Sorry about that spelling. It literally means the better state, the better fortune or condition, good welfare and felicity. So these are... These are the words that are used to describe salvation 
or moksha in, in Hindu literature. Now, what is salvation in the Hindu literature? I will just show you the progress of what salvation, how salvation, the concept of salvation, how it grew through, um, through the Hindu era. The Vedic idea of uh, salvation includes deliverance from guilt and sin. Later on in the Upanishads, it signified a release from the cycle of rebirth. Later on in the Mahabharata, the great epic of the Hindu literature, it is described as a transition from a lower self into a higher self where no one has a sense of I or mine. It is a transformation into which uh, that is eternal, unmanifest, and immutable. To attain liberation, one must do good to other men. Thus, the concept of liberation in the Mahabharata is described as purification from the lusts of the world and growth in the likeness of universal self, Brahman. The Bhagavad Gita also accepts most of the previous notions of salvation. It, um, the term nirvana in Buddhism is also an adaptation of this concept. Another interesting, uh, interesting concept in the Hindu soteriology is Krishna. Krishna is, is essentially known as the savior god, for he incarnates not only to save the world and mankind from the forces of evil that put them in peril, but to sustain the law of righteousness. He also, Krishna, helps men to realize the path of liberation from rebirth and to reveal the true nature of God, man and religion, thus manifest his love for men. So that is Krishna. Hence, let's sum up the idea of moksha in Hindu literature. Salvation or liberation consists of a mixture of ideas. It is the realization of Brahman, the liberation from guilt and sin, purification from the lusts of the world, the transition from the lower self to the higher self, where the individual is transformed into that which is eternal, unmanifest, and immutable. They also believe in the Savior God, Krishna, who saves the world from evil and maintains the law of righteousness. So if you get this, this is basically the outline of moksha in Hindu literature. If you see this side, these are some of the places, some of the gods that Hindus worship. That's their temples. And there are many rituals and acts and ways of devotion they follow to attain this moksha. And some of these sites are gruesome indeed. And as we witness them uh, in, in India, you are questioned, what are they trying to achieve with this acts? But only if you realize that in Hinduism, there are four ways to salvation. And uh, I'll be listing them down for you. But the three main ways of salvation is the way of action, the way of knowledge, the way of the love of God, and also the way of meditation. These are not strictly separated since the various techniques to attain salvation are often combined. So the way of knowledge, knowledge, it proposes a transformation of the human conscience. The devotee on this path seeks to attain purification. They intend to let thought and meditation proceed unhampered by bodily functions and is often pursued through a life of ascetism and yoga. So that's the way of knowledge. The way of action is described as a way of sacrifice and ritual actions. It adds social responsibility to the rituals as an essential element. It encourages one to fulfill his or her duty in the world, but not to be tied down to the world. The devotees are called to a life of selflessness. They wish to be selfless to the degree that no more ties of any sort are created. That means they have neither good nor bad karma. So that is the way of action. The way of divine love is based on the love of God, which is accessible to everyone. Bhakti yoga is basically devotion to God, love for God, and being loved by God. This is central to this way of salvation. It is, recipro it is a reciprocal movement between God and man, who mutually approach each other in love. 
love for God prompts service of God and which is expressed in every thought and deed. Thus, the ideal of salvation is essentially the fusion of the individual with the absolute, that is Brahman. It is marked by an entrance, sorry, it is marked by an entrance into the supreme consciousness. Once this takes place, the devotee is characterized by the sacrifices, rituals, social responsibility, and devotion he or she exhibits. Now let's compare salvation and moksha, moksha and salvation, similarities and a few differences. One of the major similarities of the Hindu and Christian belief is the recognition for the need of redemption. Both have a sense that they are fallen creatures in need of divine intervention. Christians and Hindus look forward to redemption through a higher being. The Hindus seek Brahman, the absolute for liberation, whereas in Christianity, the act of redemption is initiated by God and man allows him to work in their hearts. Also, salvation or moksha is the ultimate goal of life for either a Christian or a Hindu. Now we'll briefly compare the definitions of Hindu, um, of, of salvation in Hindu literature and try to see if we can connect it to some of the Christian concepts. For instance, tarana, which means enabling to cross or liberating, can be related to Jesus' ministry of liberation in Isaiah 61, 11. Anyone who believes in Christ is liberated from the captivity of sin and is bestowed with power that enables him or her to overcome all things. Second, tarana and raksha, okay, I'm asked to end now, can also mean signify uh, defense and shelter. We can see a concept of this, the same thing, uh, which is related to God in Psalms 27, 31 in Isaiah and Revelation. Mukti and moksha, which is deliverance, can also be seen in the act of God throughout the ages in Exodus, in 1 Samuel, Jonah, and Philippians. Shreyas, which is a better state or fortune, can also be referred to eternal life and eternal pleasures, which God God, uh, God promises us in John 3, 16, 5, 17, and Psalm 16, 11. Thus, Hindus can also understand the Christian concept of salvation once we clearly see that. Even the way of salvation in uh, Hinduism and uh, Christianity can be compared, although there are, are, are slight differences. The Jnana Marga proposes a transformation of human consciousness and it basically uh, it focuses on self. But Adventists believe that God is a mis mystery and can be understood, cannot be understood with human wisdom alone, but through guidance from above. Worship and life of good works is something that is identical in both. The major difference in the experience of salvation in the two religions is the attitude it is approached with. One uh, thinks about working out and accumulation of good works while the other relies on Jesus to give them salvation. Okay, some of the application just, just um, to briefly mention some of the, some of the innovative uh, approaches we can tr to reach out to these people is to, um, to form ashrams, which is a Hindu style of meditating centers. If we have them on our campuses and, in, and uh, we could attract more Hindus because meditation is a form of their worship. Centers of influence that offers health or family or social services. If we create an avenue for Hindus to uh, fulfill their social duty to the community, we can also reach out to them as we minister to the community around. If we, um, the major thing is to remove the westernness of Christianity. KJ Moses says that the current challenge to Christianity is to show that the gospel is universal and that Christianity came to India long before 
the, the Westerners came in to form the EIC, East Company India. Dr. Selvaraj Muthaya also pro proposes a three and a half year program. So it is not a short journey, it is a long shot towards reaching to the Hindus. Wagner says, and I will conclude with this, missionary strategy is never intended to be a substitute for the Holy Spirit. Proper strategy is spirit-inspired and spirit-governed. And if we create a, a venue which is open and which allows other religions to feel comfortable, we can surely, we can surely have a fruitful outcome. It is true, Jesus, that the right pattern of relationships between God, humanity, and the world can be established. And the Holy Spirit prepares the way for the church to fulfill its mission more effectively. Thus, I think with the understanding of the Hindu soteriology and few of these contact points, we can, with the guidance of God and the Holy Spirit, reach out to our brothers who are in need of salvation. Thank you. Now we are ready for only one question from our presenter for the sake of time. So anyone who... Okay, from there. Thank you so much for the presentation, my sister. Uh, I'm just wondering within the presentation, and probably from a little experience in India of through your study, uh, probably you encountered a way in which uh, we can still keep the conviction about Christ as the only way of salvation and reaching the Hindus. Because according to the little knowledge I have, they don't refuse that. The only thing is the way they relate to him, just like the Muslim act acknowledge Jesus as Isha, the prophet, Isa, the prophet, Isa, the prophet, and I believe the Hindus also will embrace Jesus, but how would we still keep that purity of the value? Yes, that, that is an interesting question, because Hinduism is already a pluralistic religion, so it will just embrace Christianity into it, but how do we keep the purity of it? I, I believe that it is not our work to convince people. Yes, we can present the truth and we can come up with innovative measures to reach out to them. But moreover, it is the working of the Holy Spirit that can convict the heart. It is not any of our jobs that, uh, that can convert a person, but it is the Holy Spirit that will continuously speak to them and will convince them once they know the truth and once they see your life. I'm sure that they will be convinced to live a life of purity and, and they will be focused in their religion. I, I hope I have answered your question, Pastor. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll now pass the mic to the moderator to 